Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a free trade agreement between the United States and 11 other countries. We have free trade agreements with six of those countries and five we don't. Big countries like Vietnam and Malaysia, New Zealand and Japan. It, and I, there's some copies of some uh, information that you have, some slides, um, it cuts tariffs. It will cut all tariffs on manufactured goods. It cuts agricultural tariffs substantially. It eliminates other non-tariff barriers that our manufacturers, our farm and services communities face overseas. It sets in place stronger rules on issues like transparency, um, good government practices, investment, non-discrimination, fair treatment, uh, reciprocal government procurement, uh, and it provides binding rules on dispute settlement uh, to make sure that the words on those pieces of paper, and they're long, and most of, but most of those thousands of pages, mind you, are tariff cuts, uh, that those obligations will be upheld. In a world where imports of U.S. manufactured products come into the United States, two-thirds of them already come in duty-free, from the manufacturing perspective, we see huge gains in eliminating up to 100% tariffs that our manufacturers are facing in big and growing markets like Vietnam and, and Malaysia. But the non-tariff barrier side, the basic rules of the road of the system, which by the way, are sort of the basic rules we have here in the United States, like in the investment chapter, which comes exactly from our Constitution and the Administrative Procedure Act so that governments don't misuse their power against the private sector. These are strong rules, and we believe that this is going to grow the ability of manufacturers to engage in that part of the world and grow our manufacturing here. We have two Eds in there. The last names they both begin with G, so I can't say Ed, Ed, Ed Gerwin. Well, I think the important thing about the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that it is a modern trade agreement. You know, our politicians seem hell-bent every time you turn on the TV and watch a political debate. Everyone wants to relitigate NAFTA. NAFTA is a 20-year-old agreement, and trade has changed remarkably since then. Uh, primarily because of the power of the internet and because of efficient and modern transportation and logistics. It's a lot easier in many ways to trade. But trade is also changing. And, and I like to talk about the three major changes that are occurring in trade. We're seeing big changes in who can trade. We're seeing big changes in what we trade. And we're seeing big changes in how we trade. So for example, who can trade? It used to be really hard for small businesses to trade. But now with internet platforms like eBay and Etsy and PayPal, it is a lot easier for small businesses to trade. And if you look at what small businesses now do, those that are internet enabled, um, those on the eBay platform, 97% of them trade but only about 5% of our regular small businesses trade. In terms of what we trade, look at the digital apps on your smartphone. Nobody envisioned any of this back at, at the time of NAFTA. The global market for digital apps is only about 10 years old. It drives hundreds of billions of dollars of commerce, and it depends on digital trade flows, something that was, not, was, was probably a footnote at the time of NAFTA. And then how we trade, there are whole new ways of trading. Sending, you know, I, I, I've told a story in, in an article I've written about a woman who's designed 3D printable shoes. And her business model is these, she's going to ship them to boutiques all around the world. You go, they scan your foot, and zap, out comes a custom designed pair of shoes. That's an entirely different way of trading than back in NAFTA. And you're probably wondering, is he going to get back around to TPP? The important thing about TPP is it sets modern rules for a changing global economy, for changing global trade. It has, and I've written extensively on this, extensive provisions to help small businesses trade. They can take advantage of these new platforms 
but then at the same time, we're using the power of the government to do what I'm sure many of you in this room think is important, and that is getting rid of governmental barriers to American trade. Uh, there are extensive provisions for small business. There are also important rules of the road for digital trade. You know, think about it. Uh, Google was registered as a domain name in 1997. That's about the time our global trade rules were last updated. So what that means is we don't have a lot on the books globally um, to govern digital trade. The way we do have rules that make it easier for, for um, or open freer trade for goods and services. So what the TPP would do, I think, Ed, you and your colleagues have estimated, what, 24 different digital provisions that the TPP would help? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, it would do many things to make digital trade flow more readily, including establishing the very important principle that governments aren't to interfere with the free flow of digital information, unless they have a legitimate reason for doing it, like privacy or national security. So I've been really focused on these two aspects of the TPP, on small business and on the digital economy. And the reason I have is because we're ignoring the fact in mu much of our political debate that trade has changed and we need modern agreements like the TPP that will help the United States take advantage of that. I mean, if there is a country in the world that should be able to benefit from trade that's more friendly to small business and that depends on the digital economy, it should be the United States. Thanks. Eddie Gress. Okay. Um, let me uh, sort of dial a little bit back or pull back a little bit. Um, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, is an agreement that uh, we've negotiated with 11 um, partner countries. They are Canada, Mexico, Peru, Chile, Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and Japan. Together, our, 14 part our, our <laughs> 11 partners make up about um, $3 trillion in imports each year. Um, that means every 1% of market share gain is about $30 billion in exports. Um, they include three of our five largest trading partners in the world, Canada, Mexico, and Japan. And second, TPP is a, what you call a comprehensive agreement. Um, it is 30 chapters um, trying to take on pretty much every major issue that Congress has identified to the administration in its bipartisan negotiating objectives uh, set out last year. Um, it's, it takes a while to describe it, but let me hit four things that I think are really high points of this agreement. Um, one, as Linda mentioned, um, you, you may have seen pictures of TPP looking about three feet high. Uh, about um, two feet of that are tax cuts, elimination of tariffs. Um, that includes three inches of U.S. tariff elimination and about 21 inches of foreign tariff elimination. Um, examples range from Vietnam 70% tariff on cars to Japan 600% tariff on out of quota peanuts to uh, Malaysia's 30% tariff on paint. Um, our three inches of tariff elimination, they include things like 11.2% tariff on bamboo shoots and 8.5% tariffs on straw mushrooms. Those are things that are going to help the proprietors of Asian groceries across the river in um, Alexandria. Or likewise, uh, elimination of 48% tariff on cheap shoes that people will buy up the street in Southeast. Um, second thing about TPP that we're quite proud of, um, TPP is the first US trade agreement in 22 years since the Uruguay round that created the WTO to eliminate a subsidy. This is subsidies that contribute to overfishing and um, depletion of fisheries in the Pacific region. Um, that is a major environmental accomplishment. It is also a very appropriate reform of bringing government out of an area that it shouldn't be operating in. Third, uh, TPP is a very comprehensive agricultural agreement. Um, it includes tariffs, sanitary and phytosanitary rules, fair approaches to geographical indications and, another, and other issues. To just give a sense of the scope of the, the farm trade part of this, Japan eliminates a 40% tariff on American cheese. It creates a 114,000 ton country specific quota for American wheat. It cuts tariffs on beef from 38.5% to 
and it agrees that Japan will never accept rules that bar imports of U.S. wine, which use labels such as ruby, tawny, vintage, fine, chateau, and other words that certain parties across the different ocean are trying to uh, <laughs> lock down and take out of uh, the, um, the world of trade. Um, as Ed mentioned, it is the most advanced and ambitious um, digital trade agreement the U.S. has ever done. It uh, requires um, all the TPP members must re require, uh, allow free flows of digital data across borders. That is very important to internet companies. That is very important to manufacturers. If you see, for example, a modern tractor, um, they take data flowing about weather, about seed uh, placement, and they transfer it back and forth all the time to centers in the United States. And that's what makes an American tractor so attractive and so effective. Um, TPP countries cannot uh, require servers or other computer capacity to be located in country if you want to serve um, the, the market there. And TPP countries must have anti-spam, privacy, and anti-cyber theft uh, policies. So um, we feel that this is a, a very advanced and very high quality uh, internet and digital agreement. And it's also a kind of strategically important one because each day the future of the internet is kind of being determined. Um, one of the things that Ambassador Froman, our cabinet officer, likes to say is that TPP is an effort to write the rules for the next global economy. In this world of digital trade, which is important to us as computer users, to services companies, to manufacturers, all, all the rest, the United States stands for free flows of information and consumer protection and open, uh, flow, open flows of information around the world. Uh, government of China, government of Russia, government of Egypt, others are trying very hard in the United Nations, World Conference on Information and Telecommunications, International Telecommunications Union, to set up a principle of internet sovereignty, which is to say that the digital border is the same as the physical border, and any government has an absolute right to stop flows of data, to censor it, to redirect it as they choose. And this is a case where one of those visions can determine the future, but they can't coexist very easily. And this is one of the biggest long-term things that we see at stake as Congress is considering TPP. Well, I think, first of all, as I mentioned, um, a lot of what the TPP does is reduce foreign governmental barriers to American commerce. It makes um, trade freer for American companies and workers. Uh, many. Uh, countries want to impose these barriers and make uh, our economic uh, activities more restricted. Uh, TPP, as Ed, I, I, I want to get those numbers from you, Ed, by the way, of inches of <laughs> okay. TPP. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful word picture. But much of what TPP does is reduce governmental barriers imposed by, by foreign countries. And in terms of the way the process works, I'm not a congressional person, but my understanding is that there is nothing in any of these trade agreements that requires the United States to do anything. At the end of the day, it's Congress that would have to react to actions that, you know, for example, violations of the TPP. Uh, Congress has the last word, and that is very important. But I think the key point is, that we're actually creating greater freedom for people by eliminating many of the barriers that currently exist in the trade system. For example, as Ed mentioned, the efforts of countries to limit the ability of people to trade digitally by trying to you know, require that our companies put servers in their country or saying that we can only store data in their locations. I would add two, two points on this. It is a sovereign act of a government to negotiate and conclude a trade agreement. That's a choice. If we want to isolate ourselves, we, we heard how Doug described Smoot-Hawley, you know, unemployment went up, exports went down, imports went down. Uh, not the type of result. And it was found following that with Cordell Hull um, and, and beyond that unemployment only went up again after the Smoot-Hawley tariffs when the United States started its reciprocal trade agreements program and started negotiating as a sovereign with other sovereign countries so that everybody would be reducing their tariffs. And that's the trading system that began uh, in, that, in that period and has continued forward. So it is a sovereign act of a government to choose to enter into a trade agreement and make these. But I think the more important point, and building on something um, both Eds have said, 
This is building on U.S. values, U.S. rules, U.S. systems. Uh, so much of what is in the TPP is reflective uh, of the rules we already have in the United States. So the United States, uh, if we hopefully get to implement it this year, is not going to be making a lot of legal changes. We're not changing things that we've done wrong. Uh, we've got a few tweaks here and, and a few statutes to make. But this is basically exporting basic values, things like the takings clause of our U.S. Constitution uh, that requires the government to compensate a private property owner if they take their property, due process principles, equal protection principles, fair and equitable treatment type principles that we see also in our Administrative Procedure Act. These are baseline principles that we in the United States have developed as part of our democracy, as part of our capitalist system, that we are trying to get the other parts of the world to adopt. And so this is very much, very much uh, an act of our sovereignty. Yeah, I don't really have very much to add. These are very you know, well, uh, well presented points. The, the, the only additional thing, Linda and I became acquainted as congressional staffers um, not so long ago. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, and constitutionally, all of this is foreseen and set out. Um, Constitution tells Congress to regulate uh, commerce with foreign nations, it tells presidents to negotiate agreements with foreign countries, and that is exactly how TPP has been done. Congress has looked at our relationships, they have set negotiating objectives for us, we have done our very best to meet those objectives, and Congress now has the chance to act on them. So, uh, no, I do not see that there's any diminution of sovereignty in that. We're exact, you know, this is exactly the way U.S. government has been told to act by the framers. Yeah, it, seem, it, it, it seems to me that anyone who objects to TPP on the grounds that it uh, somehow uh, uh, is an unwarranted reduction in U.S. sovereignty it, it must object to all treaties in principle. I mean, and, and, but the Constitution clearly provides for the treaty-making power. Yes, we had our very first trade yeah. agreement, I believe, it was 1794. Uh, yeah, Jay Treaty. we've been and sacrificing our sovereignty for quite some time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, to build on Linda's point, it's really amazing when you look at it, the degree to which other countries are being asked to change their rules. Uh, we went uh, last September to Vietnam and we met with government people, manufacturers, and people from the International Labor Organization. Vietnam is agreeing to set up independent unions. And you gotta remember, this is a socialist worker's paradise. They're not supposed to need anybody other than the government to look out for the welfare of workers. But they've agreed to do that in part because they want this agreement, but also in part that they recognize the fact that, you know, there are already a lot of wildcat strikes now in Vietnam, and they recognize that maybe having independent representation for their workers would be a good thing for them as well. But these are huge changes that other countries are making that redound in many instances to the benefits of American exporters and American workers who produce for exporters. This is a question from someone in the audience. Uh, how do you see TPP two years from now under either a Clinton or a Trump presidency? Wow. <laughs> well, uh, can I take a first step? Absolutely. That? As uh, one of the laws that we in the government operate under is the Hatch Act. And we are not permitted to say anything about um, presidential candidates or their proposals. But let me talk about TPP as it is likely to play out as you know, analysts have uh, you know, looked at it and, and modeled it, and as people who are kind of engaged in some of the issues it raise, um, you know, make the case for it and point out what might happen in its absence. Uh, there have been a number of um, professional, you know, independent modelings done on the TPP. Uh, these show um, different things depending on what your assumptions are and how much of the agreement you model, but they agree, um, both the International Trade Commission and the Peterson Institute, that TPP will raise the rate of economic growth in the United States to some extent, that it will raise wages in the United States. And in the ITC's model, they find the first year, uh, which would be 2017, uh, if it were implemented um, coming this year, there's a jump in GDP of about $20 billion. About two-thirds of that goes to workers in the form of higher wages and uh, some degree of new jobs. 
Peterson Institute um, has different figures, but comes out with the same figure of, of growth beginning quickly and two thirds of the benefits going to workers. Look a little bit more detailed. Um, one of the groups that's really interested in TPP and working very hard on its ratification is the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, I've mentioned big cut in Japanese beef tariffs. Uh, what they say is that, um, I have this written down somewhere, um, NCBA says, our future success rests on our ability to compete on a level playing field in the Pacific Rim, and TPP presents us with that golden opportunity. So that's, uh, they say, if we have TPP going to effect, we'll be selling more beef to Japan, rancher incomes will rise, all those sorts of things. Without the TPP, we have some erosion. Um, we are not the only country that's doing trade agreements. And Australia, Japan, FTA went into effect a um, year ago, January. Uh, the NCBA believes that has already cost them, by virtue of uh, tariff differentials, uh, about $140 million in exports. And in the absence of TPP, that will continue and it will be replicated across many, many industries. Because um, at the moment, as we're debating TPP, there's also negotiation of a much lo uh, very large China-centered regional co closer economic partnership agreement, which would create a large duty-free zone excluding the United States for China and Korea and Japan and Australia and New Zealand and um, 10 Southeast Asian countries plus India. So that, that's a big thing. And the, the future will evolve in, in the absence of TPP and one in a way that isn't all that great for us economically. Second point, a uh, person I'd like to quote, um, this is our Pacific Fleet Commander, Admiral Harris, um, who's looking at the implications of TPP for security and strategy. And what he says is, TPP would strengthen stability and security, deepening our re relationships throughout the region, and raising the bar to protect the things that matter. Things like enhanced cybersecurity, privacy, and provisions to combat the theft of trade secrets, including by cyber theft, to protect our defense industrial base. And obviously, our partners who've signed up for TPP, this is our allies, Japan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so forth, see it as a vital demonstration of America's enduring commitment to the region. So in the absence of TPP, if it does not go into effect, there will be um, a significant economic penalty in a number of areas. And there will be a large and impossible to quantify, but probably somewhat serious um, blow to the US position in the Asia Pacific, which is uh, a big thing. Uh, the, this is a serious choice and one that has implications in a lot of areas. Maybe I could build on um, Ed's first point, but look at it from the manufacturing sector. US uh, manufacturing is alive and well. Doug sort of talked about that a bit. We manufacture more today in the United States than we ever have before, but for um, many of the reasons that Doug talked about, we do so with fewer workers. But we are at a status quo disadvantage in the global economy, and you have on, on the, the slides. We face, in the United States as exporters, higher tariffs than 129 other countries, including China, including Chile, including Mexico, and every member state of the European Union. And all of those countries, the reason why they face lower tariffs in their exports is because they've negotiated a heck of a lot more trade agreements than the United States has. We have 14 trade agreements with 20 countries. Those 20 countries are outsized purchasers of our products, purchasing nearly 50% of US manufactured exports, even though they represent 6% of the world's population, 10% of the global economy. We do better when markets are open, when distortions are eliminated, and we're in a global economy where we're not just competing against ourselves, in these foreign markets, we're competing against all these other countries. From our perspective, we've got to open up these economies. And one easy example, and this is in, in the slides as well, is we are losing market share right now, and we have been over a decade uh, coming to China in those four TPP economies where we don't have trade agreements, but they do. So that's Brunei, New Zealand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. We used to be about 30% of the import share to those markets. We're down to about 10%. And China has completely taken it and taken it above our share. We are losing under the status quo. So we've got to figure out how to get this done uh, or we are going to continue to lose. And so we are working very hard trying to um, get the administration to solve some of the outstanding issues so that we have a political ability to move this agreement during the lame duck. 
uh, working with Congress as well, because you need both sides to work on this. But that's got to get done so that we can get this agreement implemented. Well, Don, I think it's a truism that political candidates are usually a lot more, a lot less favorable toward trade than presidents happen to be. Uh, it's amazing when a candidate gets into office how they have a change in perspective when it comes to trade. Take, for example, President Obama. You know, he campaigned uh, in many ways against NAFTA in 2008. He got into office. It took his team a while to kind of get up and running, but eventually they realized the wisdom of three trade agreements that the United States had negotiated uh, with Korea, Colombia, and Panama, and pushed very hard for those agreements to get enacted. Then they've taken the reins as well on uh, TPP and other initiatives that the Bush administration started. I think the same would happen with a new president. Uh, if TPP were enacted during the lame duck session, I think a new president, whoever that is, would start to realize how important those agreements are to the United States economy. I think one of the things they would realize is the day they're in office, they're going to be a whole bunch of other countries knocking on the door saying, you know that TPP? We want in too. I mean, there are a number of other countries that are sitting on the sidelines who want to join the TPP and be part of this greater Asia-Pacific uh, free trade area. And smart presidents would realize that's some geopolitical leverage that they could use to their advantage. So I think that's something that extre that's extremely important. Um, and you know, again, they would also recognize the benefits of these agreements. Uh, Mr. Trump was quoted as saying at a rally, I think it was in Kansas, that the day after he's elected president, he's going to get rid of high duties on American beef to Japan. Well, if the TPP is enacted before he's into office, that, product, that process will already begin. And I think he, he and other, and, and, and Secretary Clinton as well, would recognize that ultimately this is in the strong benefit of, uh, of the United States. It's not easy, it will be messy like all our politics are, but I think eventually people uh, come around to recognizing the benefits of these trade agreements.